joining us for our lunch. I'm Allison, Manager of Communications at Novagold. I have the pleasure of introducing our CEO, Greg Lang, who will be giving the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Can, can you hear me okay? Good, and thank you for taking the time to get an update on Nova Gold. Yeah, I come in from Houston, Texas, and it just seems strange to come to New Orleans and have fajitas, but they are pretty good, so pl please enjoy them. All right, as I'm sure everybody is aware, our presentation does contain some forward-looking materials, and that's available on our web page if you'd like to read that at your leisure. All right, Donlin Gold is a, it, it, we're really a pretty simple company. Nova Gold owns half of the Donlin Gold Project up in Alaska. Donlin is one of the largest, highest grade, undeveloped deposits in the entire gold industry. You know, the couple of key attributes of the project, it's scale. You know, we're just under 40 million ounces, which is, uh, you know, tremendous. I've been around a lot of gold deposits over the years that ultimately got to 40 million ounces. None of them really ever started that big. So Donlin has tremendous scale. You know, the grade is exceptional at two and a quarter grams for an open pit mine. You know, we've uh, you know, got tremendous exploration potential around the assets. You know, we're up in Alaska. Alaska is the second largest gold producing state in the U.S. You know, it's a fine jurisdiction. It appreciates the natural resources industry. And we're, you know, really happy to be up there. And I think as we're all aware, the world continues to get more and more complex especially for the resource companies operating out on the frontier. You know, if you follow, uh, you know, the Panama situation with uh, First Quantum, basically they built a, an amazing copper mine and the, the country is in the process of uh, basically expropriating it or shutting it down less than a year after they built it. And that's, Panama was considered one of the safer jurisdictions. You know, that doesn't even take into account going into many parts of Africa or out on the frontier in the Baluchistan. You know, the world is getting more and more complex. And if part of the investment thesis behind this company is that assets in safe jurisdictions will command a premium valuation. The other thing about, we've got great partners. You know, we own half of this asset. The other, our co-owner is Barrick Gold one of the largest gold producers in the industry. I think they're second largest. You know, and uh, people follow us, but they also follow our partner. Barrick's uh, Q3 call was uh, two days ago, earlier this week. And they, uh, you know, mentioned uh, the activities at Donlin and the significance of the project to them. So we've got great partnerships with Barrick. We're also uh, on private land owned by two Alaska Native corporations. You know, Donlin has been, a, it's been a journey for me. I joined the company a little over 10 years ago as the CEO. Our chairman and largest shareholder, Dr. Thomas Kaplan, joined when I did. You know, we restructured the company. We set about uh, slimming it down. We cashed it up. We did an equity raise in 2012. That was the last time we've gone to the equity markets. It was over 10 years ago. Very few companies in the development space that don't have revenue like us can go that long without needing to raise equity. So we're very careful with our money, and we're still in great shape financially. So we restructured the company. We set about turning it into a pure gold play focused on the Donlin project up in Alaska. <clears throat> and that's, again, part of our belief that you know a pure gold play in a great jurisdiction will ultimately command a premium valuation. And generally speaking, that has been the case over the years. So we set about permitting. You'll see in some slides coming up, we have successfully completed the federal permitting. We received a joint record of decision from the Army Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Land Management a few years ago. Oh, that's all right, thank you. We are one of the few federally permitted projects. And while we've been uh, Wrapping up the federal permitting, we've also been advancing the state permitting. So really the schedule to take this project into construction is really in the hands of the owners at this stage. Yeah, and just a little bit about Alaska. You know, Alaska, we all think of Alaska as the, you know, it's still, even though the production's declining, it still produces 8% of the country's oil. 
and it comes down through the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. And so it's a state that really understands the benefit of a strong, healthy natural resources industry. You know, in the United States, we tend to vilify the resource industries, particularly the oil companies. But, you know, we need the oil, and we're going to need the oil for a long time. And that's why states like Alaska, who understand the importance of natural resources, and they understand the importance of a healthy mining industry. Frankly, it's a great place to do business. And we like being up there. And I've mined, throughout my career, I've mined gold all over the world, from Africa to Australia. And there's very few places I'd rather be working than in Alaska. The other thing that really separates Donlin from many other projects, we're on private land that's owned by two Alaska Native corporations. And this ownership came about, uh, for those of you that remember Richard Nixon when he was in the White House, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act was brought into law to clear up the overlapping land claims that the Alaska Natives had. So they formed this Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act so the pipeline could be built. And throughout this act, they formed 12 native corporations and transferred certain state and federal land into these native corporations for their economic self-determination. You know, the land that Donlin resides on was always known to have mining potential. So it was designated for mining activities. The mineral estate was transferred to a corporation, Chalista, and the surface rights were transferred to TKC, another native corporation. You know, we have, in essence, life of mine agreements with these two native corporations. And they have an owner's stake in seeing this project go forward. You know, Alaska, you know, our project is in a very, very impoverished part of the state. And I think it would, uh, you know, the nearest community to the mine site, Crooked Creek, about 15 miles away, you know, half the homes don't have running water. I mean, I think it would be an embarrassment to most Americans to see how impoverished many parts of rural Alaska are. You know, these are tough, tough places. And the Donlin Project is really the only economic engine that's on the horizon in this part of the state. So it's very important to them. Our native partners have been staunch allies as we've worked our way through the permitting process. You know, they've been great advocates in Washington, D.C. as, uh, you know, the Biden administration has delayed many mining projects in the last couple years, and they haven't touched ours. And I think it's because of the native ownership that we've been uh, somewhat shielded by an overzealous Department of Interior. So it's a great, uh, great situation to have that underlying native ownership. Now I'll let you read their, uh, you know, the commentaries from Andrew Guy and Andrea Gusty, how important this project is to them and their people. You know, we operate a camp up there during the seasons, and we typically employ a lot of. Uh, you know, native Alaskans, and it's you know that's the most important thing for them is the jobs that the project brings. You know, and I'll, I'll touch on this briefly. I think we're all aware of how environmental, social, and governance-related matters are. You know, they're becoming more and more of the forefront in the natural resource industry. And you know, we're a development stage company, so a lot of the metrics uh, you know don't yet really apply to us. But we've gotten a great uh, environmental record at the site. You know, we do have, operate the camp and have drilling activities. We had a tremendous safety record. We're somewhere on the order of 12 years, accident-free up in Alaska. You know, and we engage with the communities. And when we're operating the camp, over 80% of our employees come from the surrounding region, our native, native Alaskans. You know, so we're, we're really quite proud of that. You know, our board, you know, we're a, a development stage company, but our board is uh, yeah, about a third ethnic my minorities. Women are well represented both on our board and in our company with over half of our employees. Women and our directors and board are very well diversified. Yeah, Donlin, in this, the next couple slides really put this asset in the context of what else is happening in the global gold industry. You know, Donlin, if it were built today per the feasibility study, it would be one of the largest producers out there, a little over a million ounces per year in a mine life that's measured in decades. And the other projects, uh, KSM, somebody had mentioned Seabridge earlier. Other than KSM and Donlin, the output of the future mining projects drops off tremendously. 
And I think as the industry is challenged to replace reserves and faces declining production, you know, these big assets are needed you know, to sustain uh, the production levels. You know, grade is another, uh, I've been mining gold, geez, I hate to tell you, almost 40 years, and the grade continues to decline. You know, two and a quarter grams, the grade at Donlin is about where the industry was over a decade ago. You know, and the grades continue to decline, and that continues to push the mining costs and gold production costs up. You know, industry-wide, all-in sustaining costs right now are approaching $1,300 an ounce. Donlin, because of its grade, will have among the lower costs in the industry. And there's a lot of new mines been built on grades about a gram. So Donlin, you know, the grade really sets Donlin apart. This slide uh, you know, really just highlights the area where the Donlin gold deposit is situated. You know, Donlin uh, you know, occupies our Ackman and Lewis deposits about three kilometers of an eight kilometer gold bearing system. And we've drilled uh, up and down the system and have you know, gold bearing intercepts you know, all the way from Queen to Ophir to Dome. And when the time is right, we'll resume exploration. But we've got over 40 million ounces in and around the ACMA and Lewis deposits. And this represents about 5% of the total land position at the Donlin Gold Project. So when the time is right, we'll resume exploration. And I expect we would uh, you know, substantially add to the reserves and resources. You know, the third quarter, uh, you know, we continue to advance work up at the project, you know, working with our partner. We did a lot of the field work necessary to support the design of the tailings dam and other uh, water retention structures. That's been a big focus the last couple years. We're also fine tuning our understanding of the hydrology and the impact that the mine will have on the ground and surface waters. Another project we had this year was the reclamation of an old placer site that was operated by a fam the Lyman family many years. And we you know, took that over when the mine started permitting, and now we've successfully reclaimed it. But it was their placer operation that the family ran you know, quite successfully for many, many seasons. You know, also, uh, you know, we're very active in the communities up in Alaska. We do this in, uh, really in concert with TKC and Chalista. And we're, you know, I personally get out to the native communities uh, you know, many, several times every year. You know, we've been participating with them on uh, a project to remove hazardous waste from these villages. You know, these villages are really out in the middle of nowhere. So the only access is uh, the river system in the summer months or the frozen river systems in the winter months. And some of them have small airstrips. So anything that goes out to these villages end up staying there. And they accumulate some hazardous materials and waste, car batteries and the like. So we work with them in the state to remove these materials and uh, you know, safely dispose of them. You know, we also work with uh, Excel Alaska and other organizations to train young people for jobs in the future mining operation. You know, these folks, uh, there's not a lot of economic opportunity out there, so the concept of uh, you know, a day job, if you will, working you know, eight days a week, and the mines typically work two weeks on, two weeks off, you know, they're not trained for this yet, so we have very active programs to get the local workforce ready for when the mine is built so that they have the opportunity to participate in the mining. Uh, permitting. We talked about that earlier. Uh, you know, permitting in the United States, it's a, it's a very arduous public process, but we did it. You know, it cost us... Uh, a little over six years in time and uh, somewhere on the order of $150 million to complete the EIS. I mean, it's, and we knew that when we started. That's just the nature of permitting in the United States. You know, we were quite successful at it. The Army Corps of Engineers and the Bureau of Land Management issued a joint record of decision. And that's, uh, you know, we're pleased to have that behind us. You know, the federal permitting was, uh, you know, that takes the lion's share of the time. But we've also, while that's been done, we've been working our way through the state permit applications. And you can see the ones listed there. So really, the only remaining permit that we have is for the tailings dam and the water retention structures. You know, in, uh, you know, the federal permits authorizes us to disturb wetlands. That's basically what a 404 permit does for you. And that includes the tailings dams. 
But in Alaska, these structures are administered by the state, hence uh, you know, another level of approval. So we're uh, you know, finalizing our state uh, permits, but you know, with the federal permit and the record of decision, uh, you know, we're, we have the authorization to go forward. You know, it's America, we're a litigious society. I haven't been around a mining project that somebody didn't try and block for probably 20 years. And that's, uh, you know, certainly been the case with ours. And we're, you know, we've been, uh, you know, we anticipate that when you go into it. And we've, every court ruling and every appeal that's been filed against the project, uh, you know, the Donlin project has prevailed. And we expect that will continue. And this just, uh, you know, a little bit more detail on some of the permits. The state, you know, some of our permits we've had for many years, we're actually in the position of renewing them. And that was true with the state uh, air quality permit and the various water rights permits. So, you know, we continue to, you know, keep our, cur our permits, uh, you know, current and in good standing. You know, I mentioned litigation. Uh, you know, the state of Alaska, and it's interesting, they don't actually sue the mining company. They sue the entity that granted the permits. So in this case, it's the state of Alaska or the federal government. But we were a participant in this lawsuit, and uh, we have prevailed. And I expect we will continue to prevail as this uh, works its way through the court system. And you know, we're part of the reason that Donlin enjoys such strong support with the local communities is we've been out there for over 20 years, ever since the predecessor companies to Nova Gold and Barrick have been active on the site. You know, we work with the different villages. They know who we are. We participate in their programs. And, uh, and actually, this is a group of, you know, people from Crooked Creek, the village closest to the mine. And they traveled to Washington, D.C. to really uh, lobby the Biden administration, uh, please, this mine is important to us. Let it go forward. And let's not get it caught up in... Uh, some of the political machinations that we've seen. So it's very important to have that local support, and we never, ever take it for granted. You know, the company, uh, hey, we're, we're in great shape financially. In 2012, in February 2012, we did an equity raise. We raised $330 million at $9 a share. And uh, you know, we've sold an asset along the way, and we still have a very healthy treasury. And along the way, we also spun out a company called Nova Copper at the time. You know, when we restructured the company and focused it on uh, the Donlin project, one of the dividends to our shareholders was the Trilogy company. And we cashed that company up when we spun it out. So we've uh, been very careful with our money. We sold an asset to Newmont a few years ago for $200 million. That's kept our treasury strong. And it's the Galore Creek project that Newmont now owns with tech. And they've been steadily advancing that project. You know, if, uh, and it's projects in British Columbia, if the owners of the Galore Creek project go forward with it, we have a contingent payment of $75 million due to Nova Gold. And, uh, you know, the jurisdictional risks that face gold miners, it's every bit as bad in the copper space, yeah, perhaps worse. You know, we don't count on that money. We don't need that money right now. But I think with the, the seriousness that Tech and Newmont have advanced Galore Creek, uh, I think there's a good likelihood that it will, you know, will come to pass. And if it doesn't, I'll feel even better about the $200 million that we did receive on the transaction. You know, leverage, I mean, and I've, as, I, as I come to this conference and talk about uh, gold, and I've got a couple slides coming up on why you might want to consider gold. But the one thing about the companies in the development space, you know, there are a lot of ways to buy gold. The producers, the ETFs, you can own physical assets. I saw somebody with a nice silver bar in the room earlier. I mean, there's a lot of ways to hold gold. But really, the leverage, if you want the maximum leverage to rising gold prices, you should look at the developer space. You know, that's where you really get uh, you know, extreme leverage to prices of gold, and you look at what you know, today's gold prices, our project is, is really quite robust, you know. And we've, uh, you know, we anticipate that prices will continue to go higher. You know, gold, uh, next couple slides, uh, you know, really, I mean, if you're going to look at a company like Nova Gold, you would only do so if you had a constructive view on the price of gold. Otherwise, you wouldn't touch any gold stock. You know, gold goes through cycles. And, 
you know, we've been in a period of consolidation the last year or so, you know, and we've been hovering somewhere around 1800. And we seem to have put a hard floor in at 1800. Right now we're trading close to 2000. And as we've seen in other periods of consolidation, when gold starts to break out, I would expect the, the trend to be really pretty dramatic going up. So we're sitting here at the top of that third cycle. You know, gold is, is moving quite nicely, and it's unfortunately part of it's driven by events in the Middle East. You know, we all shook off the, the war in the Ukraine and the war in Europe, but the Middle East is a much more frightening proposition to the world than the war in the Ukraine. That's just, you know, there's so much, uh, yeah, the risk there is far greater. So it's uh, been pushing the price of gold. I think gold's up $150 since uh, the conflict uh, started. And gold equities, uh, yeah, again, there's a lot of ways to play gold and a lot of ways to get exposure to gold. The equities have, have frankly been out of favor this last year. Most of them are trading, you know, have broke away from uh, correlation to the, to the metal itself. You know, gold is uh, trading very strongly at almost multi-year highs. You know, it touched $2,000 earlier this year. Its all-time high is about $2,070. So, you know, if we can get above 2,000, it has the potential to really, you know, do a pretty steep rise, and I think that will, you know, bring gold equities uh, along with it. Both, uh, you know, all the resource stocks have been, uh, you know, really largely out of favor this last year. Okay, and this is a, a part, uh, an interesting chart that's lost on a lot of people. You know, for many, many years, the central banks were big sellers of gold, and. You know, in the last few years, they've switched from selling their gold stocks, their gold hoards, to, uh, to buying. And I think, you know, the central bankers are educated consumers. I think they fully understand that there's tremendous risk with all of the fiat currencies that they hold. And particularly, uh, you know, we're gonna, we're, de-dollarization is starting. And that, you know, when you look at the price of gold in just about every currency, other than the U.S. dollar, it's at, at near record levels. I think it's somewhere north of $3,000 in Australian currency. It's well over $2,000 in Aussie dollars. Gold has moved strongly except in U.S. dollars, which is where it's, the trade is largely denominated. And that's, uh, yeah, I think that's going to change. You know, we're seeing uh, you know, the U.S. dollar has been strong because of rising interest rates. You know, that, the Fed cannot keep raising rates forever. The dollar is, I don't think it's peaked yet, but it doesn't have a lot higher to go. And when it starts to move, I think it will, gold will be one of the biggest beneficiaries of a weakening dollar. Yeah, I don't think there's another currency other than the US dollar that will rise up to be a global reserve currency. So I think the dollar will continue to dominate, but gold will take its place as the natural cycle in the weakening gets underway. You know, Nova Gold is a, you know, it's an in interesting company. You know, we're a billion three market cap, and that's, you know, it's come off substantially this year, but we're a billion three market cap. And the one, you know, when I come to conferences like this, and I've, I've worked in mining most of my career, in fact, all of my career, and I look at all of the companies, and the hardest thing I have to do is differentiate between them. Because as, even as a mining person, it's, it's just there's so many choices and so many great stories out there. And one advice I have, and that's, uh, you know, follow the money. You know, we're a, we're a Nova Gold institutional quality company. I look at our major shareholders. Uh, you know, Electrum is Dr. Kaplan's investment vehicle. He's our chairman and largest shareholder. Uh, Fidelity is a big uh, shareholder. That's primarily Will Danoff's Contra Fund. You know, it's spread around other Fidelity posters. Uh, Paulson, of course, John Paulson. Uh, you know, BlackRock, First Eagle, Saudi PIF came into the story a few years ago. You know, they had approached us about uh, participating in the financing of the mine. And we said, hey, we're, you know, we're quite a few years away from, from needing that kind of money. But, uh, you know, they ultimately built a position in the company and are still one of our largest shareholders. But it's really, uh, you know, almost 70% of our shares are in the top 10, and, uh, you know, really those shares rarely trade. Okay. The upcoming catalysts are about, uh, you know, wrapping up my presentation. Uh, 
you know, we're continuing to work with our partner, Barrick, on moving this project up the value chain. You know, we'll be in the process of, uh, you know, guiding the marketplace on budget and plans for the 2024 field season. But it's, a, you know, it's an important asset to us. It's the company to us, and it's, a, you know, an important asset to Barrick. And you can, uh, yeah, I just uh, turn your attention to their recent quarterly report. And I think that's... Uh, the, the closing slide, just to wrap it up, you know, Donlin's a, you know, a great asset in a safe jurisdiction, uh, good grade, good exploration potential, and uh, you know, we're a company that uh, I see no reason for us to raise equity until we go to fund our share of the Donlin construction, you know, which is still a couple years into the future. So thank you. I think I have uh, some time for, for questions. Well, the, the feasibility study was uh, a few years dated, so it ultimately when the time is right, we'll need to update that. A little under $7 billion was the original estimate. You know, with the inflation that we're seeing, it's, you know, no doubt it's gone higher. But, and, you know, we track these things. Inflation really roared for a while, and it seems like it's starting to roll over and come, come back down. But, you know, it's still a, a, a capital-intensive project. And the biggest part of the capital is... Uh, you know, we're in an empty part of the world. So all of your infrastructure you need to bring in. But I think it's, uh, you know, it's to each owner, let's say it's $8 billion, make the math easy. You know, about $4 billion to each owner. And I think if we're uh, in a price environment, I think gold is going to go higher when we need to fund this. So, you know, raising that kind of money, it's not, uh, that does, doesn't not really worry me. And I think... Uh, you know, what we won't do is, uh, you know, we get approached by other mining companies, and, you know, we wouldn't sell the company. We want to stay in it for the long haul. And we're, you know, we're fortunate at this stage we don't need a partner. You know, we've got enough cash to see this company through to funding our share of the construction. And that's the time, if we look to put the company in play, that's the time we would do it. But we're, you know, we've been very careful with our money. We're a small business. We have about a dozen employees. And, uh, you know, like I said, we made the, made that money last, and you know, a lot of the companies you've encountered through this conference are, you know, on fumes. Really, it's just a tough, tough time in the gold space, and we've been, uh, you know, we, we're fortunate with that kind of shareholder base and a, a strong treasury that uh, it affords us the ability to take a long, measured view of the future. Sure. Yeah, we are, uh, you know, our feasibility study, you know, we've way past the PE, PEA stage. You know, our feasibility study is, is stale. You know, it's just uh, was done uh, over 10 years ago. You know, when the feasibility study was done, it was endorsed by the owners and permitting started. And that was many years back. So, you know, we're very prudent people. You would not go forward, particularly in inflationary times, without an update to that feasibility study, or certainly a refresh to the capital and operating costs. Okay, last question. Appreciate your leadership at Barrick. Um, and coming over to Nova Gold, does your board have any desire to be acquired, or are you through this to the end? You know, uh, we'll do what ultimately is in the best interest of the shareholders. You know, the, the company is... Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not for sale. Um, you know, Nova Gold, uh, you know, we're a volatile stock. I mean, as, as they would say, we're not for widows and orphans. You know, we were, you know, we're about 350 a share now. We've been uh, as high as 12 and everywhere in between. So it's, uh, our, our shareholders really are in it for the long haul. And we certainly wouldn't entertain a sale now. And I think we've taken the view that, uh, Take this asset, it's a great asset, move it up the value chain, and when the time is right, either bring it into production or uh, sell the company. And I think we're, you know, the company is exactly positioned how we want it to be. You know, when we started permitting all these years ago, gold was $1,100, $1,200 an ounce. Most of the time we were permitting, you know, we'd do a, a conference like this, there was nobody in the room. Nobody cared about gold when it was $1,100 an ounce. The gold is $2,000 an ounce now, so people are starting to pay attention. And you know, I like the way Nova Gold is positioned. 
you know, we got a lot of cash. And that, you know, affords us the ability to be patient and take this project forward for when the time is right. But yeah, ultimately, if somebody wants to pay us for the future, we would sell the company. But I think our current, uh, current thinking is just to take the project forward. And, uh, you know, we're fortunate, uh, you know, Richard Williams, who's our uh, Vice President of Engineering and Development, you know, he built Barrick's Pueblo Viejo mine. You know, I'm a, you know, long-time Barrick veteran. I ran their North American business for eight years and their Australian business for five years before that. So we've got the, we've got the expertise in-house if that's the, the path that the company wants to go down. Yes, sir. You know, we're getting close. I mean, obviously, gold price has got to be a big part of it. And, you know, at gold at $2,000 an ounce, I think, I think, as I said earlier, we seem to have put in a floor at $1,800. And, you know, gold is at $2,000. And when we see a weakening U.S. dollar, I think you'll see it jump pretty dramatically from there. So that's a part of it. Uh, you know, we're going to need to raise equity, you know, for our share of the construction capital. You know, we've, we've never done a down round. And you know, right now, right now would be an extremely challenging time to go raise. You know, the markets are uh, uh, indifferent at best. So I think uh, you know the gold price is a part of it, and uh, also the equity markets. You know, I think uh, if gold prices move where we anticipate they will, the debt markets will be fine. You know, the money there will be people to uh, you know lend you money for an asset in the United States. But it's a combination of all of those. And I think, uh, hey, when the time is right, we'll, I think everybody will know it. You'll see gold, uh, for reasons that you can't explain, it'll jump $200 overnight. You'll, you'll see the gold equities. Uh, you know, I, I think right now, as, as we all study the equity markets, and everybody's here because they're looking for, OK, what do I do with my money right now? Nothing feels particularly good other than treasuries. And that's, uh, you know, we've all, myself included, kind of flocked to the treasuries in the last year. And I think when, uh, when that relationship fades a little bit and we're no longer enamored with the treasuries, you know, people are going to be looking for, okay, where do I go from here? And I think the, the natural resource stocks will come back into favor. And it's, you know, it's not unique to Nova Gold. Just about every gold stock out there is 52-week lows. Even the you know the very well healed ones, and it's a yeah you know, it's a pretty decent business at current prices. Yes. Yes. Do you contrast uh, Nova Gold with uh, with Nova Gold with uh, Northern Science Group? And they're in the last six years, but more uh, environmental issues. Northern Dynasty, sure, and that's a you know that's a question we got frequently asked many years ago, Northern Dynasty is the owner of a project called Pebble. And, and I remember when we started permitting, Pebble was uh, you know, the poster child for anti-mining around the globe. It was a global stop the Pebble mine project. And a couple things that really differentiate our asset from the Pebble project. Uh, one, I mean, the Pebble Project is, it genuinely is upstream from Bristol Bay, which is one of the largest commercial salmon fisheries on the planet. So that's, you know, that's a, an emotional issue. Probably could have been managed, but it was very emotional. The other important part of it is, uh, you know, Pebble was on state land, and, and we are on basically native corporation land. So we... Pebble never really, and I, I don't like, uh, you know, I, I like to tell our story and not focus on others, but Pebble never really had the local support. And, you know, and that is so critical that, you know, you can't do anything without that community support and the local support. And they, uh, they, they got started many years ago. I think it was a lot of some South African money in there early on that didn't really understand that, you know, you build these relationships before you need them. So Pebble, I think, just got off to a, a challenging start with the, the local communities and uh, you know, some self-inflicted wounds, for sure. But it's, uh, I, I think it's, 
you know, it became political, you know, and that, and once you become a political issue and not a, a technical or environmental issue, it's very difficult to overcome that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's that? Less so, Less so for us, and I think part, uh, you know, physically, I mean, Pebble is upstream of Bristol Bay, and we're in a, a very empty part of Alaska. You know, we're on, uh, you know, the, I mean, all of the rivers in Alaska are salmon bearing, but, you know, we're close to the Kuskokwim River, and uh, you know, there's no commercial salmon fisheries anywhere on that river. You know, it's just an empty area, and as far as Alaska goes, it's, uh, I mean, all of Alaska is magnificent country, but it's, uh, you know, there's no tourism-related activities or uh, anything that people would, uh, you know, really take exception to. And it's, it's striking when you fly into, uh, you know, we fly out to the site out of Anchorage, and it's about 300 miles flight, and it's amazing how little there is out there in Alaska. And so if there was a place to build a gold mine, you know, Alaska's... Uh, you know, the Donlin site's relatively low ele elevation, you know, 12, 1,300 feet. We don't get a lot of snow. You know, it's Alaska, so it gets cold. But we're, you know, nowhere near the Arctic Circle. You know, Kenross, uh, or Fort Knox mine, is, uh, you know, operates quite successfully in the interior near Fairbanks. Certainly much harsher weather there. You know, Tech has a mine north of the Arctic Circle called Red Dog. And, you know, people do operate in Alaska. There's, you know, several other you know, precious metals mines. So, you know, weather isn't a factor, and, you know, and people operate quite uh, successfully and quite uh, protective of the environment. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's certainly, uh, you know, with the right approach, it can be done. And one thing is we worked our way through the permitting, you know, having the native uh, ownership and involvement, you know, it was, uh, you know, their input was, you know, taken into account as the project was conceived. So I think that's, uh, you know, particularly in their mind, they're really the greatest stewards of the land, and they're, uh, you know, very satisfied with the approach and the, you know, impacts that can be managed that the Donlin mine would cause. <coughs> All right. Sure. Mm-hmm. Close. Mm -hmm. So how can they value the reserve at 40 cents on the dollar versus three years ago and gold at an all-time high? So I, I don't, can you answer that? Uh, I'll try. But I, <laughs> I'm not sure that I can, but I'll try. Uh, you know... Yeah, gold is always, and I went out to the mid-'80s, went out to the Nevada gold mines, and uh, gold has a, an, an emotional appeal that defies logic. I get all of and, and, and I think we're in, and sometimes that appeal is euphoric, and gold is people who just can't buy enough gold stocks. Even I think when gold first went from 400 to $800 an ounce, the gold stocks were in the stratosphere. Right. And, but it was a... They're not now because we've been down that road a couple of times, and people, uh, I think people get a little uh, fatigued with the gold rally. You know, and gold, is, it's been a teaser. Gold never does exactly what you want it to do. You know, it'll, it'll run up to 2,000, then it'll come right back, and everybody, ah, sell my gold stocks. So I, I think we haven't seen a sustained movement in the price. And I think that's caused yeah, just that investor fatigue. I mean, I look at uh, you know, our company a year ago, we were probably $8 a share. Now we're under four on, yeah, on no news other than sentiment. The SP in the last 20 years. Uh, so yes. Sustainable. Yeah. Sustained return. Mm -hmm. You know, SPs yeah. has either stopped yeah. the yeah. SP and I, yeah. I won't preach. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think you. There's seven or eight stocks. Yeah. But, yeah. But and the others are not. But the, the, it's yeah. illogical. I can't. I don't understand. Yeah. It. I don't. 
You know, it is so much a sentiment-driven trade. And when the tide, when the tide goes out, all the boats drop. And I think you, you made a very valid point. This year's S&P rally, you take out the big tech, and we're, we're nowhere, really. And, but it's, and, and that's, this, this year's market has been very thin and very shallow. And gold, you know, and it, it's obviously as a gold miner, it's very frustrating to me to see gold at near record highs, but yet the gold equities are all flat. And I think it's just we're waiting for gold to, you know, that chart that we had where we've been consolidating. We've been consolidating. We, you know, we hit $2,000 earlier this year. We drifted back to $1,800. The war started in the uh, Middle East, and gold shot right back to 2000 So it's a, the fear trade never holds. It's got to be what I think gold really needs is uh, the weakening U.S. dollar, which I think will come. You know, we can't continue to uh, the monetary policies of the last few years are ultimately very destructive. You can take a view on whatever administration has been in power and how they cause it. Either way you look at it, and you print that much money and put that much money out in the supply, the dollar is going to drop. And I think that's the, the action that we need that will propel gold prices. And I think, you know, gold's record price was uh, 2070, 2074. And I think once we break above that, I think you'll see it you know, quickly move up 2,500 and pass $3,000 in months. And, and for no reason, and for no reason. And I think that's what, you know, and I've, what we really need in gold is we're all gonna wake up one morning in an overnight trade, gold jumped $150, $200 an ounce. Just because people are starting to run out of investment options. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's a patient, gold is an investment vehicle. It, it does require patience. I mean, you know, you're, you're right. Broadly, over the long haul, gold outperforms the S&P. But ev not everybody remembers that. And the other thing that they'll point out is that gold equities have not outperformed the S&P. In fact, quite the contrary. You know, there's other than a handful of uh, real winners in the gold space, by and large, it's been a very difficult investment area to make money. And uh, I think that's, uh, and, uh, you know, and we have a lot of the generalists. Uh, you know, Will Danoff at Fidelity is a delightful, delightful guy. And, you know, Will is always one of the first into a party. But I remember a few years back, Will called up and says, hey, don't take it personal. What was his exact words? We're all puking out our gold shares. We've had enough. And it just, and I think it was just almost irrational selling. And then a few years later, gold was bouncing along, and Will calls up and says, hey, when are you guys going to be back in Boston? I said, well, <laughs> Will Danoff will be there <laughs> whenever you want us. Anyway, Will built up a big position in the company, and he, he's done well with it because he got to the party, you know, and that's probably why he's been so successful all these years at Fidelity. He got to the party early, and that's what everybody, I, and it's, uh, I, I don't have an answer for you other than, but the time that uh, you're waiting for the right moment to buy gold, and that moment, you probably won't know it until it's in the rearview mirror. And you look back and say, God, I should have bought no, some I gold. How about, uh, how about, what is the answer? I think I'm, 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 I'm always interested in everybody, <laughs> always interested in everybody's perspective. <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, it's an exciting, it's an exciting thing to own. But it's a very, uh, Gold stocks are not for the faint of heart. What's that? Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But I've, I've always said, if I ever say the words were undervalued, strike me down. <laughs> because the marketplace sets the value. And we're, we're 350 a share because that's what the market thinks we're worth. You know, we're, hopefully the market uh, sentiment will change. But, you know. Thank you, and and I think yeah, I, th I think to my earlier point, we're levered. You know, we are a highly levered play. When gold moves a little, we move a lot, in both directions. So yeah, as I said, we're.
I always, uh, yeah, my wife's in the back room, I cringe when somebody we know says, oh, I bought some of your stock. It's so, <laughs> why did you do that? <laughs> you know, because it is so volatile. As long as you understand that you're buying uh, an investment vehicle that's, uh, that's high risk, high risk, high reward. But that's what it is. One other quick question. Sure. Mm. It costs more, but it's not so much temperature related. Okay. It's because you are so far away that all of the things you need, you have to bring up to Alaska. You know, the fuel, the bulk commodities, the people. But, I mean, the ground and everything being harder are uh, immaterial? It, somewhat immaterial. You know, and uh, I worked in the rural Nevada for a lot of years. Winter in rural Nevada is cold in northern Nevada. You know, not... El you've been to Elko. I've been to Elko 45 below. And it's, I mean, it is a factor, but it's not, material. not material. And a lot of people operate quite successfully in the northern climates. And then last question, and you said it three times, I'm going to ask it one more. Being in Alaska, having your assets in Alaska as opposed to in the Congo mm -hmm. and other places, yeah. I, I do, and I, I, yeah, I mean, you know, Alaska, you know, once you navigate the permitting in the United States, I mean, you can go to the Congo and have permits in a year. Yeah, you know, and the Congo. Yeah, the Congo, uh, Mali, you know, pick some, yeah. some funkier jurisdictions. Yeah. You can get permitted quicker. Once you navigate that in the United States and you understand that uh, litigation is part of the process, right. you get through all of that. You build the mine, you can keep the fruits of your labor. You know, you, you know, look at Cobra Panama, you know, the first quantum. Uh, I think just in the last week, their market cap dropped in half because the government of Panama said, well, we're going to have a referendum about this mine. I mean, that's how quickly you can turn in these uh, frontier countries. And it's hard to price that risk into your investment decision because things are fine right up until the day they're not fine. <laughs> yeah, I was in, still with Barrick when we built the mine in the Dominican Republic. Uh, at the time, it was about a $5 billion investment. The government stopped the first shipment of gold at the port and renegotiated the deal. And uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah but it, it, it does happen. So, you know, oh, I know you're, you're being a little facetious, but yeah, the, the world is complicated. and. And I think the other thing that we'll see, if we see a tremendous increase in the price of gold, you know, the mining companies will be printing money, and they will become targets. Whatever jurisdiction they are in, they'll be more vulnerable than they are today. Oh, thank you, folks. I appreciate everybody taking the time today. <laughs>